minutes and you shall be heard. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Court is now open. You may be seated. Good morning, Mr. <laughs> Ms. Liz Leardon, you may proceed. Thank you. May it please the court. Uh, the plaintiff in this matter, Richard Gasher, was a 20, nearly 20-year 20 employee of the defendant Mass General Hospital uh, who brought this case after losing his job because his employer would not provide him the reasonable accommodation of extending by several months a medical leave of absence that he needed occasioned by a, a serious heart condition for which he had treatment. Uh, after he was cleared by his physician to return and was capable of performing his job, the defendant posted his job and hired others to fill it despite his, his many years of conscientious and well-regarded service to his employer. Ms. Fisleton, yes. I thought at the time that he was out on medical leave and at the time that the, that the uh, whatever the p number of days is under the federal statute requires that the employer give leave, that at that moment he wasn't sure when he would return. That, well, that's incorrect. That's a disputed fact in the record because Mr. Gasher did provide notices to his employer of date uh, of when he expected to return. Before the expiration of the Family uh, Medical Leave Act? Yes, I believe he did inform his employer that he intended to return. He provided a series of notes stating return to work <coughs> dates. Uh, and he was, in fact, able to return at the time uh, that he had expected to. Um, the FMLA uh, uh, on or before the expiration of the Family and Medical Leave Act? No, no. But the disability discrimination law um, does not limit uh, a reasonable accommodation of a, an extended medical leave is not limited by the 12 weeks that are protected by the FMLA. Um, both state law and federal law uh, in the area of disability discrimination can provide greater protection for an employee who needs a leave of absence. Um, the issue is whether or not it would be an undue burden on the employer to provide the reasonable leave, the request for leave and whether the request for leave was reasonable. Twelve weeks, the twelve weeks guaranteed by the FMLA for certain employers who have 50 employees or more um, is, is a floor, so to speak. Uh, it is not a ceiling with respect to the rise. Aren't, aren't we here principally to decide whether his claim survives? Yes, we are. The, the, the merits of his claim itself are not at issue in this appeal. Um, I know your position. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. M Mr. Yasher filed this case in 2001. Uh, the case was ready for trial in 2003. Unfortunately, during the pendency of the litigation, Mr. Gasher was diagnosed with another illness of cancer. Um, when it became clear that his condition was very grim, his prognosis was not good, um, he made attempts through counsel to hasten the trial of the matter uh, over the defendant's objection. Uh, the defendant opposed Mr. Gasher's attempts to move up the trial. Um, and eventually the trial was postponed until September 2003 uh, and Mr. Gasher died a little more than a week before his trial was scheduled to begin. Two days after Mr. Gasher's death, counsel appeared in court and Mass General Hospital suggested that the case should now be dismissed because Mr. Gasher had not survived to the time of the trial. So the issue before the court today is whether or not a discrimination claim brought under Chapter 151B survives the death of the plaintiff. Uh, the court expressed interest in this question before in the case of Alba versus Raytheon, but then did not need to reach the issue because the case was decided on other grounds. Um, the question is settled under federal law, is it not? Well, in our review of the cases, we found more than 20 cases by the federal courts finding that discrimination claims do survive, um, and that th those cases have been decided under state survival statutes, which are similarly worded very broadly, comparably to the Massachusetts survival statute. Well, We're, I thought the United States Supreme Court had spoken directly on the question, hasn't it? Um, yes, I, I believe that was under a state survival statute, but, but yes, the Supreme Court has spoken on this. There are only a handful of cases that we found that, that say that discrimination claims do not survive, and those are, um, one relates to the peculiar wording of one state statute, um, <coughs> and, and one didn't contain an, any real analysis of the issue, and another 
really raises a different issue from the issue here. So does this just survive as a, as a tort or as a contract? Well, there are three ways that this court could find that this case survives. Um, first, it's not even necessary, as uh, Mila has pointed out in its amicus brief, to apply the survival statute because Chapter 151B itself allows for the survival. Um, the court has said that uh, actions to redress personal rights uh, do not survive in the absence of a statute, but Chapter 151B is that statute. Section 1 of the statute, which defines a person who may bring a claim under the statute, includes a legal representative. Um, also, Section 9, which describes how uh, a person may bring a claim, states that the claim can be brought in both superior court or in probate court. There'd be no reason for that language to be included in the statute if it weren't envisioned by the legislature that a claim would survive a party's death. So without even getting to the survival statute, the court can and should find that a 151B claim survives a party's death in its entirety. Um, uh, Mr. Richard Gasher is here as a party today also to urge this court to reverse the superior court's holding that punitive damages abate uh, even though compensatory damages survive. If the court finds that 151B does in fact allow for claims to go forward in the face of a party's death, uh, there would be no reason whatsoever to find that certain um, elements or certain damages that are cognizable under the claim would not survive. Um, if the court were to apply the survival statute, in addition to 151B uh, containing the language about legal representative and bringing a matter in probate court, there's also the fact that it specifically states it's to be construed liberally to advance the, uh, its purpose. Um, and that any statute that's inconsistent with it, um, Chapter 151B would trump. And in the case of Thomas versus EDI, this court found that the, the <coughs> contribution statute would not apply to a 151B claim but, because it's inconsistent. But 151B does not say in a simple sentence that these claims survive. No, it, no. It, it does not. It, can, it needs to be inferred from this other language. Um, and in this court's past decisions regarding what types of claims survive, the court has looked to uh, policies underlying uh, certain types of claims, has looked to what other jurisdictions have said, particularly in the cases of McStowe and in Harrison, uh, I'm sorry, McStowe and Sheldon, uh, the court surveyed and found that the majority of other jurisdictions did find those types of claims, a legal malpractice claim and a will contest claim to survive. Um, in keeping with this court's tradition of providing even greater protection to victims of discrimination than, than the federal courts have provided, it would be a striking departure if this court were to adopt the draconian minority rule that a discrimination claim does not survive a party's death. Um, now, if the court were to look at the survival statute itself, um, the survival statute enumerates types of torts, uh, types of torts that survive uh, in addition to claims that survive under the common law. Now, this court has repeatedly stated that a Chapter 151B claim is not a tort, most recently in the Stonehill case. Doesn't that end the inquiry with respect to torts? Um, well, that is... It, the court has at times said that it's, it's not a tort, but it's tort-like. It's not a contract, but it's contract light. Um, plaintiff submits that, uh, first of all, the survival statute does not apply. Even if it does apply in the alternative, uh, it does not apply because 151B is not a tort. Um, chapter 151B claims have also been likened to contract claims. Uh, the case of Rendeck is, is directly on point wrongful termination claim brought under a statute. Right, but that was, that was a different statute. It's a different statute. In terms of contract, it seems to me you have two problems. One, it's not strictly a contract claim. It's only been said it has things that make it a little bit like contract claims. But many 151B claims occur in a context where there is no contract. Uh, and in fact, uh, vast numbers of them. An applicant for a job who is denied employment a person who is denied public accommodation, a person who is denied housing. You know, their, their claim is that they weren't able to even enter into a contract relationship. I'm troubled by an interpretation that would say 
well, some 151B claims are going to survive if they happen to arise in a situation where the parties do have a contract, but otherwise they're not going to survive because no contract has been formed. That seems a, an odd an odd result. Well, I, I agree that would be an odd result. Of course, in this case, there was an employment relationship. Uh, Mr. Gasher worked for the hospital for almost 20 years. Um, in REndeC, there was no written employment contract, um, but the statutory scheme that had a provisions for only termination I, for I don't cause. have a problem with the idea that, that you had some, your client had some form of relationship that we could call a, a contract, even though it was at will. It was still an employment relationship. But suppose he'd just been applying for the job in the first place and said that he was, uh, dis, you know, denied the job because of his disability and, and denied uh, reasonable accommodation. He, he wouldn't be able to say that he had a contract. Well, that's one of the reasons why the, the distinction between tort and contract um, is a, it really is sort of an artificial type of um, explanation for what kinds of cases, what kinds of claims survive. Uh, and this court itself has recognized that that is a bit of an antiquated notion from the common law and has not um, strictly said that it, well, has said that it should be more a question of substance over form. And this analysis of whether a claim is more like a tort or more like a contract is a bit of a legal fiction. Well, well, what's, other the cases, what's the date of the survival statute? Um, the survival statute, I believe, was in, originally enacted in 1934. And what's and, the date of the discrimination statute? Um, Handicap discrimination. Um, not in the 1930s, that's for sure. No, it was, so it was it's fair to say that the legislature, I mean, the survival statute hasn't been amended in any relevant respect. It's fair to say that the legislature didn't have discrimination laws in mind, correct? Um, that, that's correct. Um, the, now, this court has recognized, though, that the question about what types of claims survive is an evolving correct. concept that, um, it, in fact, it's stated in the present tense, claims, in addition to claims that survive at common law, not survived at common law, uh, recognizes that the court doesn't have to look back at the historical notions of what types of claims survive. But as the court recognized in, um, I believe it was in the, um, the McStow case, um, this is a, this is an evolving, it's an evolving fluid area in which the court can, um, the survival statute was not intended to limit the types of claims that could survive. Instead, it was seen as a way of expanding on the types of claims that could survive so the court could on a case-by-case -case basis decide based on evolving concepts of the societal interests and the Well, well that sounds fine in the, the context statute. of torts. I mean, it really does sound fine in the context, because torts are changing. It's yeah. torts principally common law based, and we have on a number of occasions expanded uh, tort law. And uh, so I understand in that context. But isn't the problem here that this is a unique right, set of rights, created by statute, has elements of lots of different things, but it is quite statutory. And isn't it the responsibility of the legislature to sort of clarify what it intended with respect to survivability in light of the fact that it really doesn't meet the criteria of the survivability statute? Well, no, because as this Court has recognized, the survival statute is very written in very broad terms, as it is in states throughout the country. Um, and the Court recognized in, uh, in Harrison that uh, these broad terms are, are flexible to allow the court to make a determination on a case-by-case -case basis without the need for the legislature to specifically speak with respect to each so cause of action. So we don't need a survival. I mean, if we read it so broadly, as you're asking us to do, then the survival statute itself becomes, and its various, it seems to be limitations, including identifying a specific statutory claim that is going to survive that this is meaningless. If, if it's just uh, the legislature was saying, courts just, you just decide what's going to survive, they certainly would not have used this list. Well, but this is what the court has recognized in determining that it, the tort for intentional infliction of emotional distress could survive. Like, uh, isn't that much like what Justice Cordy was saying? We have some evolving tort law. That was, certainly would qualify as a, an action of tort involving damage to the person. It would fit within the statute. In one words, I have, I, assuming you can get over the hurdle that whether this is an action of tort, you're saying it's an action of tort for other damage to the person. 
But the only kind of tort damage to the person that's normally involved in 151B claims is the emotional distress component. How is the back pay or front pay component going to fit within the concept of tort for damage to the person? Well, that becomes more like, um, more like a claim for property, which typically has survived. Um, and because those claims were normally contract-based. That's right. And that's why this case, it fits within the contract rubric as well as the tort rubric. Well, well the I, difficulty I, is the survival statute was designed, as I understand it, to address um, the survival of causes of action that were not recognized at the common law. Now, you know, so the legislature says, fine, you know, we're going to have actions which survive by the common law, and then we're going to add a new category of cases. Clearly, M the Chapter 151B is not a common law action, correct? And then you have to fall within the expansion that the legislature uh, gave. But there's really no material difference between 151B and the statutory cause of action that was found to survive in RENDEC. It's contract-like just as much as that wrongful termination claim under the, that statute was contract-like. And it's just as tort-like. That statute was only going to be applicable in cases where there already was a contract. It had no meaning outside of that context. So there's no contract, per se, in an employment, in an at-will employment context. It's only an implied contract, which courts around the country have found to allow uh, these types of claims to survive. Thank you, Ms. Lesslerton. Thank you. Mr. Lerton. May it please the court, my name is Frank Ridden. I am here on behalf of the Massachusetts General Hospital, the defendant in this matter. <clears throat> in relation to the facts of the case, while they're not at issue here because of the procedural nature of this case, um, Mr. Gashett was a long-term employee of the hospital. He went out on an FLMLA, FMLA disability related to a cardiac condition. Um, it will be our position in the case that we informed him that the FMLA was coming to an end. He then applied for long-term disability. And we were in the process of applying for long-term disability. When he didn't request at that time an extension of the FMLA, we uh, posted and rehired uh, another person into the plumbing position that he had. Um, I believe there will also be testimony that the job description that he had previously been in did not require licensure, and that at the time, uh, when he was out on disability as a global matter, not just his position, it was requiring licensure for the plumbers in that position, and that the person who replaced him uh, was a licensed individual during the time that he was uh, during the time that he was out. The survival statute in Massachusetts, we acknowledge, was aimed at uh, allowing and through the interpretation of the Harrison case, allowing certain common law torts to be brought forward and not extinguish on the death of an individual. Um, but the legislature was careful at that time not to completely abrogate the idea that personal injuries do not survive death. Contract actions do, personal injuries do not. Isn't the claim for back pay in the context of a case such as this <clears throat> more akin to a contract claim? In other words, if if it survives, it's, it's really not, uh, it's, that's not a tort, is it? That's a very interesting uh, question, Your Honor, because that is, in fact, the path that a number of lower courts have adopted in struggling with this question. In fact, it's the path that Judge McLeod adopted in struggling with this question. Well, the, um, it's, it's, and we may have struggled with it, but under very similar, you know, the federal courts haven't had a problem with it at all, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I saw the references to the federal court decisions. Um, well, it's not the references, it's the decisions. Yes, and I think the difficulties with those is that this is particularly uh, a state, this court in Alber said that this is a state legislative decision that has to be made as to whether or not Well, it um, might or these, might not be. The legislature hasn't made the decision. The legislature might not have made the decision for a number of reasons. The legislature might have, for example, taken a look at the statute, and if you look at the brief of the agency that is charged with interpreting the statute, it says forget about the, the survival statute. It's very the, clear, and the legislature may have said it's perfectly clear. Yes, and, and there is not there is somewhat of a lack of a legislative history in this regard. Uh, 
When this court looked at the AASH case just recently and the applicability of 151B and the cap to 151B, uh, the, the analysis that, the legis that this court went through was that uh, charitable corporations were uh, excluded from 151B application initially. Then the legislature came in and actually amended the statute to include charitable corporations under the coverage. And this court, and, and by doing so, did not say and the cap should apply in the statute. Can, um, I, can I interrupt you would, for a minute? Yes. Um, is it true that you can bring these actions in the probate court? That's correct, yes. The statute allows for these actions to be brought both in superior and probate. And, and this, wouldn't it be very unusual to say that this would not survive if the action itself could be brought in the probate court? Um, I think that the probate court under the statute has a number of roles, and one of them is its equity jurisdiction for reinstatement, uh, for uh, putting the person back in the job. But the uh, Superior I, Court would have similar jurisdiction. That's right. And actually, they have concurrent jurisdiction. There is not a differentiation under the statute. Yeah, but then that wouldn't be a reason for giving the probate court jurisdiction, would it? Uh, I think that my interpretation of that, Your Honor, has been that you might elect to go to probate court on some of these matters as opposed to the Superior Court. You might choose the Superior Court if you're interested in a jury trial. You might choose the probate court if you were interested in a more expeditious resolution of some of these matters. Oh, really? Yeah. You can yes. waive a jury in the superior court, the, and you might end up in the <coughs> probate court with your adversary asking the jury issues be framed and the probate judge shipping it back to the superior court to you, try those issues. You could absolutely take that approach, um, but I think that in the plaintiff's complaint, in the plaintiff's brief, it's actually acknowledged quite a bit that uh, these superior court <coughs> litigations leading up to a jury trial in these cases tends to take a long time. Yes, and but I understand that that may be the, uh, the on-the-ground reality. Yes. However, the legislature specifically addressed that by saying you can move for a speedy trial. So it, it seems to me to make no sense at all to add the probate court jurisdiction and then also to say that you can get a speedy trial in the superior court. I take it that there wasn't an attempt to get a speedy trial until after. Um, there was not. The, until the, after the illness was. And, known. Until, and that's and that's not unusual. In and in fact, words, not until after we had a jury date, a jury trial yeah, date. Yeah, and that's not entirely unusual. But for, if for some reason a plaintiff wants a speedy trial, the legislature has said these are terribly important cases and should move promptly and and grants the plaintiff. I'm not saying that there was any fault on the plaintiff, it's an option that a That's plaintiff right. has, or, f or it's an option I believe that the employer also has, correct? I think you'd have, yes, I, I, ha I think so. I think you'd have to look at recent case law to make a determination. But I that. think, again, that the legislature is saying rather than, you know, <clears throat> if, if one of the bases of relief is in fact reinstatement, yes. the employer will want to know that very quickly, and yes. the employer may have an interest in expediting it. Yes, and actually there have been significant hearings uh, in the Superior Court on an injunctive basis on that issue sure. to expedite the hearing, sure. as opposed to waiting for a full-blown trial. Sure. Do, you have um, any, do you have any sense of how many of these cases are brought in the probate court? Uh, I, I don't, I, Your Honor. I haven't seen one that's come up here that's been brought I have in. no knowledge of any that have been brought in the probate court. Um, but the probate court is not a recent addition to the statute. No, I know it. It has been there for a while, and I, and I have always... I assume, and I have no case law for this, but I assume that it was there because of the equity jurisdiction in both the superior. When this statute started out, it was aimed at providing employees with rights to maintain their employment. Uh, it has grown into a damages-type action, a damages-type uh, resolution. In fact, Section 9 was an, was an addition to the original statute. The, 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 um, Section 5 provided the remedy originally. Section 5 was the administrative review by the MCAD. The MCAD has taken an interesting position in their brief in this case. The MCAD has said our rights under Section 5 to prosecute exist even if the individual dies. Now, that's not under question in this case, but it is a position that we have actually put forth in our brief when we said the legislature may have made the decision not to include this under the survivability statute with knowledge. It, it they, couldn't possibly have done that they, because the statute was enacted after the most recent enactment of the survivability statute, correct? No, I understand that. But they have, they have not in the interim amended the survivability statute to include Chapter 151B. Yes, but there's, there's a fair amount. I mean, if, an, if, if a statute grants <clears throat> a right somewhere else, they don't have to amend it, correct? 
I'm sorry. And in other words, if the legislature, in other words, if you accept the MCAD's position, yes. which is you don't have to look at the survivability statute, you look at Chapter 151B itself. And if the legislature, if that was the view of the legislature, I see. Then, yeah, I, then it doesn't have to amend the survivability. In other yeah. words, quite often what happens when the legislature is creating some new statutory right, it's not going to go back and amend all of the other related statutes. It will take care of it one way or another within the new statute. Well, and it, and it didn't, respectfully, it didn't do this after this court invited uh, it to do that. In Albert, well, I don't think a year is a long time, but... Well, that's, I, a, that's I, a different there, question. That's a there, different question. I mean, if the legislature thought that it did it to begin with, I mean, one of the, you have the probate problem. You also have this rather odd thing saying a legal representative, you know. The, but I think the legal representative, in, in litigation in superior court or probate court, legal representatives are classically added as people to represent people who are disabled, infirm, who have no ability to represent themselves in an action. If Mr. Um, was, was the term legal representative added to Section 1 uh, when Section 9 was <coughs> added to the statute, or was it in the original version of the statute? My best knowledge is it was in the original version of the statute. Right. It was not we're, we're, not, we're not talking uh, 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 very many cases here. Most of these cases, the plaintiffs survive and go to trial. Most of the cases, the plaintiffs you know, we're survive. We're talking an infinitesimally small number of cases. Might the legislature have thought with that probate thing that someone like this fellow say, who had been diagnosed with cancer that was a little bit iffy on how, whether he'd survive or not survive, uh, would opt to bring the claim in the probate court so that his executor or administrator could be substituted if uh, what occurred uh, is what occurred here, that he passed away. I, I don't believe that that exists within the statute. I think that's what the Well, I know it is not within the statute, but couldn't that have been the legislative reasoning? Because the remedies line up... Um, the same. Can the probate court award damages? I, Obviously they can if they can. they've got express jurisdiction of the claim. They can. So yes. why then would they be put in there? Be to spread the work around? I don't believe that's why, Your Honor. Um, I believe, Your Honor, the reason that they're in there is because of their equity jurisdiction, because they have the same authority as the superior court to reinsert the individual, restate the individual, yeah. to bring the employment relationship back again. I also believe that the survivability statute is very much alive and well in Massachusetts. I do not believe that it's been overlooked by the legislature. Well, in, in fact, I, if, a, if, a, if a plaintiff were to die yes. uh, and go to probate court and have an executor or an administrator appointed, the executor or the administrator would not have to bring the action in the probate court. They could bring the action in the superior court. Uh, I, there is, that's a possible theory that they could pursue. That's right. Under a uh, type of contribution or a type of replevin or type of uh, remaining action that the individual would have had. And I think that's where you would run directly into the survivability statute, that that cause of action, that particular cause of action, does not survive. It, it clearly is not a common law taught that is evolving and that should be recognized as an exception to the survival. No, but you do have this problem, and you do have this problem of emotion. I mean, you know, our case law goes backwards and forwards depending, yes. you know, what the issue is, but I think the consistent part of the jurisprudence is an attempt to construe the statute liberally. If you can have emotional uh, distress damages, infliction of emotional distress, which you clearly can under the 151B, yes. then it's not a contract action. Nor is it a tort action, it is a statutory cause of action that was created by the legislature. And I think classically under a statutory cause of action, that is exactly the type of cause of action that needs to be added to the exceptions under the, survive, under the inclusion of the survivability would, would, statute. Would you agree with me that there's no clear-cut answer to this case? It could go either way. Well, I think that the reason we're here and the reason this case was reported is that because uh, the lower courts have struggled with the definitions under 151B. Right. So there's no, there's, no clear, there's no clear cut answer to this. Uh, well, I do think, I, well, it's, our, it's my position that if we were to say this is included under the survivability statute, that it would be a damages oriented analysis. How about and if we were to say it was included under Chapter 151B? Well, if that interpretation is there, certainly that language is not explicitly there. Yeah. There is an argument. Back to where we were. 
you're trying to come to grips with what would be the possible reason or the meaning of referencing the probate court. Would one of the possible reasons be a case where an individual defendant who had violated the statute is the one who is deceased and to allow the claim to be brought against a defendant's estate directly in probate court where the estate is being it, it could be. Probated. It could be. The, the difficulty with looking at you the... You know, a landlord who refuses to rent, you That's, know, kind of thing, could be an individual I actually, defendant in a 151B action. Um, the, it is striking when you read the statute, particularly Section 5, the degree of detail about the housing rights of individuals as opposed to employment rights of individuals. Uh, striking. <coughs> there was a great, great emphasis in the statute. And so... While we in this case and in other cases before the court have taken a damages approach to these cases, it is striking under 151B that they were very concerned about housing discrimination and that the probate court would be a reasonable alternative to the superior court in those cases, particularly its equity jurisdiction, of being able to resolve issues between parties. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that argue for giving the housing court jurisdiction over housing court-related issues? I mean, the housing court, I mean, those kinds of equitable issues, that's the expertise of the housing court. That is not the expertise of the probate court. I think they're actually oh. hearing 151B cases in the housing court. Absolutely. Under their generic thing generic that checks up about general every, everything under the sun, including first-degree murder. I, I think that's correct. I also, as long as it happens in the house. But, but the housing question... <clears throat> It's equally as likely that the housing question in the equity jurisdiction that is exercised by probate court judges to resolve disputes between people without uh, jury determinations, it easily could be said that the housing court issue is why they pushed it to the probate court because that is more the type of issue that they resolve than the superior court. No, but the, the housing court is where you push the housing court issues. Is well, I don't point. know why they didn't mention the housing court, actually, because the housing, they do go on at great length about both the superior and the probate court dealing with housing issues. Well, I don't issues. think the housing court existed, did it, when the statute was well, drafted? I would have to supplement on that. I'm not yeah. sure when the housing court existed, was, so. was created. But, the, but on the issue of the probate court dealing with the housing issues, it is very likely that that is why they put it there, because they are much better at dealing with equitable issues between parties where a jury is not necessitated. The evolution of the uses of jury under 151B has been dramatic, both in this court and in other courts and in other jurisdictions. But, I mean, we, now the employer doesn't have the right to that appellate to a jury trial. Um, but if you read, and I would ask that this be taken into consideration. Section 5 is an alternative course of dispute resolution set forth by the red legislature. They did not see all of these cases going to jury trial. They saw the MCAD dealing with a lot of them. The they didn't MCA see any cases going to jury trial. The jury trial issue came up through this court. Correct? I think the jury trial, the appeal to the superior court was afforded to both parties under the original statute, and that included... Well, there was no reference to a jury trial. No, there was case. no that, reference. That, that's right. That's a separate issue. That's right. No, I... Well, anyway, I guess that's my time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very Lee. much.